Welcome to the Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. Larry is the author of over 40 books, the founder of Dove International, a worldwide family of churches and ministries in six continents, and has over 50 years of leadership experience. He and his guests will share inspirational leadership insights from their journey with God. These insights, gleaned from serving leaders in many nations, will transform your life and leadership. For more information on Larry's books and resources, visit LarryKreider.com. Larry Kreider here with Merle Shank talking again today about leadership and keys we can learn, little keys we can learn about leadership that can make a huge difference down the road. Man, so whether you're yeah. a present leader or a future leader, we've got some good stuff for you today. Man, Larry, it's so good to be here with you. I love this. I love being, you know, in these conversations and just wow. talking and hashing out some good truth and hearing also from you. I mean, just come on, like. The years of experience you've had. In, uh, you made me so sound many. like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I not, am. Not intentionally, when, no. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Yeah. When I travel to different nations, I pick up these leadership principles from people unexpecting who are doing stuff that just blows my mind. Stuff we, we don't even see in America. Okay. So, for example, you know, we talk about church. We're going to talk about church leadership a bit now, even though this applies to all kinds of leadership. Right. Here in America, your average church is 75 people. Some people are part of big mega churches. Some are part of most people, smaller churches here in America. And there's certain types of leadership principles you need to make that work. Right. Okay. But there's this thing I see in India and Africa and I mean other parts of the world in mm-hmm. South America and it's they, they in China I've seen it hugely they call them church planting movements right yeah okay. and the leadership yeah. of these things are amazing and there's stuff in America we haven't even hardly heard of and I think we can learn a ton from them right. and so I've seen some of it I know you've been kind of inside this yeah system. I was just recently in an African nation where one I think is just kind of getting to the boiling point um, yeah. where things are kind of getting out of control in a good way uh, what do you mean by out of control so you know three months ago there was 153 churches. Okay. I just got a text uh, two days ago, two, three days ago saying, yeah. hey, there's now 205 churches. <laughs> and, That's out of control. Right. And that, yeah. you know, how that happens is I think they're six or seven generations deep in terms of like one person discipling a few people, those people discipling a few people and planting churches, uh, those churches, you know, those churches now being discipling people and releasing to plant churches. So, and they're doing this without a lot of outside help or yes. And I think, yeah, that's it's, you know, I think there was an original training that happened. Um, and, and one of the things that were taught was, it ha- you know, no matter what you're doing, it has to be transferable. It has to be easily transferred to somebody else. So, okay. you know, and it's kind of in the West. I think we have this mentality that uh, we are led by specialists. Right. And right. So, That's true. And that can go even into the church world where. Well, we need a specialist of theology, and, and I love theology. Sure. It's necessary. Sure. And, so do I. Um, but when it comes to, like, discipling people and seeing the gospel grow, like, if you look at, at the New Testament, if you look in the book of Acts, like, they grew through relational lines. Like, yes. one of the things I, I love to study, and this is maybe a, a little bit of a sidebar, but just how all the disciples were connected, you know, like Peter. Tell me more. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? So like, okay, so Peter and Andrew were fishermen, right? Right. Well, so were James and John. Okay. So they would have been, they would have known each other beforehand. I mean, they're in Galilee. They're, it's not a big town uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Their fathers would have been in the same business okay, together. Okay, gotcha. So they, you know, they would have known more each organic, other. organic, natural. Before, right. Before, uh, and, and, you know, before Jesus called them, they, w- they would have had knowledge of each other. And you go through that, like uh, Matthew was the tax collector who everyone probably knew. Yeah, you know, yeah. At, probably didn't, li- probably right. didn't like, you know, but, exactly. but everyone knew who he was. Um, and you, you, you kind of go through like all of the disciples and even some of the early church, like John Mark, he was, uh, Mark was, yeah. was, uh, uh, Barnabas's nephew. Yeah, yeah, just so, a young you know, kid, really. Right, <laughs> you know, so he was Barnabas's nephew, nephew, and then uh, Paul. He ran with Paul for a while, and then when Paul and Barnabas split, like Barnabas went with John Mark. Well, how because does this, he was family? You know, okay. I mean, how does this right. apply to leadership? So this is what we see. I think a lot of times in church planning movements is the gospel travels along relational lines. Okay, okay. and so you know, on those relational lines, like where people are free to share with people they already have relationship with, with the people who are already in their lives. And 
um, what they have to give them is transferable. Like they're, it's not dependent on a professional spiritual yeah. leader as yeah. much. Uh, you know, I heard one person say like, uh, man, you know, this, these, this type of movement is so powerful because you don't need a Bible scholar. You just need a Bible. Uh-huh. And so teaching, one thing that they teach is from the very beginning, like from the first dis- discipleship discussion, from the first time somebody gets saved, they tell them like right up front, like you can, you can share this to other people. Yes. And there's yes. an expectation right away that they will, that they will share it to other people, that they'll share it to people in their lives, uh, share the gospel to people in their lives already. And then do the same thing. So the expectation for churches being planted, discipleship in churches being planted, is instilled from the very first relationship, yes. like the very first get go, uh, as they're as they're doing it. You know, it's a very I, empowering structure. Yes. One thing that scares me, more honestly, yes. is I feel like in America we have all the principles and all the leadership stuff down. I'm concerned that we don't go to these other countries and ruin what God's doing there already yeah. because of our methodology of what leadership looks like and coming from <laughs> what it looks like here. Yeah. And they're really doing the stuff. I mean, I was, remember I was in China some yeah. years back ministering to leaders of the underground church. I thought, what am I doing here? I want you to come and lay your hands on me and pray for me. Yeah. And what you're doing is a lot more phenomenal than anything I've ever experienced in my life. Yeah, that's true. I mean, with some of the missionary friends that I have and everything, we, you know, we talk about this. Like, yeah. how do we how do we keep and, and some of it, honestly, Larry, is just money, right? Too like money can ruin things sometimes, and, and you have to be careful because we need We've to take care of each other. You know, I mean, we have a responsibility to take care of our brothers and sisters. Yeah, if if the Lord has blessed us in a certain financial capacity, but you know, I, I think sometimes where things can break down is when there is a financial dependence. Yes, where someone's saying, "I'm not going to." disciple anymore. I'm not going to reach out until I have this money. Yes. And I don't think that's necessarily the motive right away right. or even a, a conscious motive, but it can, it can be cast in such ways as like, I have all this vision, like, and this is, this is the price tag to this vision. Yeah. And it, kind of the expectation is like, Hey, if I, as soon as I get this money, I can do all this. Yeah. And, and that can be really restrictive. Okay. I think and I think from the, you know, from the West, like we need to be careful that like, hey, let's find people who are already busy. Right. Who that, that's if they right. didn't have money, they would do it anyway. Yeah, that's a good you leadership know? principle. But, you talk about yeah. relational Christianity, how it happened with the disciples and John Mark and Barnabas, right. et cetera. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we want to make sure we don't ruin people with money. But you're saying find people doing things already and yeah. they're probably the ones that'll do it best. I think so. I think number one, they're bought in I yeah. mean, they're and they're sacrificial. So they are doing it already. Like they're paying a price. Their skin is in the game already. They're paying a price and I think every single one of us, I, I know this about me, maybe, maybe not you, but no, just kidding. Yeah, I'm but, sure it's me too. Uh, we all learn by failing forward. That's right. So we try right. something right. and it didn't work. We try something yes, else. That's and really didn't true. Work. And yeah. when we don't allow that to happen, so someone who's already busy, they're already busy, you know, making mistakes and recovering, making mistakes mm-hmm. and recovering. And mm-hmm. eventually like in that, even no matter how spiritual we are and how yeah. led by the Lord we that's are. That's right. There's always things that we learn by doing. Yeah, I've said many, many you know. times that you know, we, research and development is a really important thing in the business world, but we don't allow that in the church. We say, wow. no, you, you can't yeah. try that in the church because you're supposed to really hear the Holy Spirit perfectly and everything. Well, Paul the Apostle didn't even do that. <laughs> he tried to get yeah, into Macedonia, and, yeah. you know, in Asia. And he ended up in Macedonia. Yeah. He tried Bithynia, tried Asia, and yeah. God said, no, no. But he finally said, well, we assumed the Lord's saying, yeah. go into Macedonia. And they saw the move of God in Philippi. Yeah. But it was just research and development. We need yeah. to allow people to try things. Well, even like in Macedonia, like he got the Macedonian call. His dream was a man, you know, calling and say, come yeah. to Macedonia. That's right. And he gets there and I'm sure he was looking for a man and what was it? A handful of ladies by the (laughs) river that was his open door. You know, so it's and I think that's true. Like no matter how led up by the spirit we are, like the Bible says that we prophesy in part. Yes. You know, so no matter how prophetic we are, yes. it's still only part. And we need to be prophetic and more prophetic. Yeah, you know? amen. amen. We're walking in the supernatural, right. no amen. question. Definitely, yeah. yeah. But it's the balance of the two. Yeah. And I think I think the Lord doesn't always just hand everything to us in a handbasket. Like yeah. 
I think because he wants faith, you know, like that's part of Jesus, you know, request is like, when I come back, will, it, will I find faith on the right. earth? And, and so no matter where we are, our life with the Lord always requires faith. Like yes. there's always steps right. of faith. There's, and you can't have faith without risk. Meaning, Incorrect. Meaning Correct. that like you can't have faith if, if like you are just moving forward, knowing exactly what you're doing, uh, you know, without trying something. Okay. You know? Now, let's get back to the yeah. church planning movement thing because, and you've had like 11 years in the mission field, you're serving the pastor of a church now, in USA, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But let's go back to CPMs. What can we learn in America as leaders? What younger leaders, somebody just getting into yeah. ministry or leadership, what else can we learn from these guys and gals who are just seeing this rapid reproduction of churches? I mean, it, it doesn't it really get down to 2 Timothy 2.2. 2? Basically, where Paul is you know, speaking to Timothy, the things that I've taught you, you know, in front of many witnesses, you should share with faithful persons who will share with others also. Isn't that kind of the, the, the background to some yeah, of this? I, yes, I think it's huge. I think also, you know, in that we have to, you know, there's there's this thing in the West where we hate failure. You know, yeah. where we, we're so afraid to fail. And so what happens is, as soon as we've learned something, and we are now responsible to teach it to somebody else. We don't want them to fail. That's right. And so we try and we, we try and protect people from their own failure, which which is good and life saving in many cases. But we we have to also say, you know what? Like the Holy Spirit's leading them as well, and we can release it. Like we have to be right. very releasing yeah. uh, as leaders. Where, and and that's one thing I really recognize in working with these guys is there is like almost no control Mm -hmm. uh in a good sense like there's no control they're they're not trying to say you have to do it this way and that way and do this and they're not calling the shots from behind the scenes they're like it is you are empowered you are empowered to reach out you are empowered to follow the the words of scripture and if you don't there's accountability but sure you know there you're empowered to to do this to reach out follow the words of scripture and to be obedient to jesus and there's, I don't know, there's just this like grind yes. that like they just get into this grind and they do it every day. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. It really is. Yeah. It, I was, I was so humbled. Like I, I came back from that, you know, particular experience and I was just like, you know what, like, man, with, with everything that I'm doing, I need to make sure that I am discipling people. Yeah. And, and just, I, a, a friend of mine who, who, um, led a, a very successful, young adult youth ministry, you know, I was talking to him the other day and I said, how, you know, what, what were some of the things you did yeah. that, that really took it from like 40 people to like 800, you right. know, like, um, and he said, you know, I used a discipleship model that many people say is discipleship, but I used it for, uh, my, for multiplication. Yes. And so, and what he found is the same principle that like when people are empowered, they can multiply. Yes. So. He, he, it was simple, which means it's transferable, you yes, know, like yes. it's real simple. Like yes. as soon as you do it with somebody, somebody else can do it. And he said, you know, we disciple people by asking three questions and, you know, he, he called it, um, uh, you know, asking how's your relationship with God? Yeah. You know, so looking up, yes. how's your relationship yeah. with God? And I've heard this before, sure. and, you know, sure. as well. Like I heard, it, I think with Floyd McClung in, in Cape town, where, you know, looking up, how's your relationship right. with God? Looking out, how is your relationship with those who you are pouring into? Mm-hmm. Those who you're mentoring, those mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. are you have responsibility in your life. You know, maybe you're in leadership or you're leading a family or you're leading a church or you're yeah. leading a small group or something. Yeah. Like, where you're pouring into people. Yes. And are you pouring into people? Yes. You know, like there's accountability for that, saying how is your relationship with those people? And then how are, how's your relationship with those who are pouring into you? Yeah. Or those who affect your life. Yes. And that's like breathing in, you know, so yes. oh, yeah. looking up, breathing out, breathing in. Uh, yeah. And how, how is that going? Like, how is relationships in your life that affect you? So that's mentorship relationships, mm-hmm. but that's also like, like parents, you know, like yeah. how's it going with your parents? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whether you're young or you're old, yeah. you know, we live, have this whole dynamic of yeah. aging parents and yeah. Uh, how's it going with your family, your kids, yeah. you know, your wife, your, yeah. your, your husband, you know, your spouse, what, cause that affects your life and, right. and just being able to be simply like just praying with people yeah. saying like, exactly. Hey, like, let's pray about yeah. that. Like, so the, ask the question and commit and immediately commit it to prayer. Yeah. And, um, that was something that, that really, you know, it's empowering. Anybody can do it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's yeah. a key that for discipleship to, to just grow. And, yeah. and you can say, hey, you need to be doing this with somebody. I'm doing this with you. You need to be doing this with somebody else. Yeah. And yeah. that was, yeah, it was a model. But it's it's really relational Christianity. People often ask me, they say, well, when you were a pastor, you know, and a few people came to Christ, and how was it that after 15 years, more than 2,000 people were part of the church? How did that work? Yeah. It was really simple. I mean, it was just God, but it was just the same simple stuff. I mean, it was just a relational thing, keeping your relationship with God, how's your relationship with God. Right. Everybody discipling other people. We did that through some kind of small groups, you know, two people, three mm-hmm. people, eight people, ten people, whatever. And then and there were, God shows the importance of spiritual fathers and mothers becoming and releasing people, not controlling people, but releasing people to do it, realizing that, yeah, ministry is theirs. It belongs to everybody. Everyone's called to be a minister. Yeah. And, and it just kind of happened behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't find buildings large enough. And it was just this God thing, you know, until we eventually turned the church over to eight pastors and started eight churches and then a movement out of right. that. Right. But really, it's the same basic yeah. stuff. It's often so simple, we miss it. So what, so what are some things, let me ask you, what are, yeah. what are some things that you see, like, uh, consistently squash that or stop that? Because a lot of times, like, this is natural. Uh, like it, it, or it feels natural a lot of times, right. uh, you know, in working with people who are doing it and everything and seeing it and seeing it in our own life and it feels natural. But what are the things that like stop that natural relationship, that natural relational flow? I think often it's looking at others who are doing it differently and think we got to be like them or wow. thinking it's just the big meeting. And I love big meetings. We have a big yeah. meeting forever. But we think it's just, you just have enough good meetings that will happen. And, yeah. But people are, we're wired for a relationship with God and each other. And on these levels you just talked about. And if we forget that, we call it the underground part of the church, right. basically. Right. If all we do is focus on the above ground part of the church, like a tree, mm-hmm. you know, we've used that example a thousand times. You know, above the ground, they see there's a tree with apples, and if it's an apple tree or orange, an orange tree or whatever, branches, whatever. But half the tree is underground. Yeah. It's in that root system. And that is where, this is the relational part of Christianity. If we as leaders stop encouraging people in that, yeah. we'll go back to what seems easy, and that's going to land nice meetings and having great meetings. The devil doesn't really care about a nice meeting. We have a bit, but he doesn't want us making disciples. Right. He doesn't want us people right. find the call of God in their lives so every person can fulfill the call of God in their lives. And good leaders will release people to do that. Now, today we do it at a different level. We do it today by encouraging church planting, right. you know, and realizing that, you know, a, a church, can, whether it's a mega church or a church of 75 or 100 people or, yeah. or whether it's a micro church, that just encourage people to use the gifts God has given them to see the kingdom of God go. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, and there's tons of dialogue out there about the, you know, the different models, you know, of discipleship, right. different models right. of, of church. And, right. you know, like we have an attractional model very right. much here in the West, which, right. you know, I, I think with is legitimate, you know, it is. It, it, because it, is. It, it breaks, you know, as our culture, as the, as the cultural fibers of relationship break down mm-hmm. in society, you know, people want to belong. They, they want to. They want to be attracted to something. They, they want to come and connect somewhere. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that, man. But then you you look at some of these church planning movements, yeah. and they're very missional church. Yeah. You know, it's it's like we are on mission. Yeah. And we're going out, and it's right. it's, it's it's really right. obeying the commands right. of Christ to go, yeah. as right. opposed to like saying, "Hey, come." Yeah. Know? Well, the real key is that we are comfortable in our own skin. We're doing what God's called us to do. And we honor God and what he's doing in every other model. There's loads of models. I would never tear down a model. I mean, if somebody's preaching Jesus, you know, Jesus, right. Paul said it well, yeah. you know, he's in prison and, you know, and, you know, and these guys are trying to do things that hurt him in prison in Philippians. He says, well, praise God, Christ is being preached. And that's really what's important. So I think it's keeping our hearts pure and clean before God. Say, God, we're going to obey you. Do what you call us to do and learn from everybody else. Yeah. I mean, when I served as a pastor for 15 years, we, any place I saw God moving in the world, any place where it was possible, we went to visit just to figure out how do you do that. And some were attractional models, some were more relational models, but you're always learning. Always yeah. continue to learn from everybody. Yeah. But then do what you're called to do. So, so let me ask you this question, Larry, because I think there's, there's a fine line here between yeah. knowing what you're called to do and doing it and right. not giving up through the hard times. Right. Because um, you just said, you said something here a little bit ago about, um, you know, comparing yourselves to yeah. other people. Yeah. And then 
almost, you know, I think what you're referencing is kind of changing strategy midstream. Yeah. And, and sometimes yeah. people, you know, like every year it's a new strategy. Like they're changing, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're changing something. And, and so there's, yeah. you know, you, you do something, it seems good, and it's going well. And then, like, you hit a snag. And instead of working out the kinks of that, yeah. you, you know, or working through that snag or just, you know, being able to go through that, that dip, right. um, you wind up shifting strategies. Yeah. We shouldn't shift. We should simply tweak. Okay. See, often I've seen leaders do this, and I was tempted to do this. You know, we used to want to shift the strategy from, you say, this is working over here. Here's the deal, Merle. There's always the story behind the story. Every place I've gone, you see God moving. There's always a story behind the story. And most people have never seen the story behind the story. Right. So, for example, right. I, I remember this mega church took off in the Midwest. And I found out later, talking to other pastors in the city, how that happened, how they sent this person out. And, and, and he told me all this stuff behind the scenes you never read about in a book. But there's a story behind the story, reasons why these things happen. Now, here's what happens. Often we'll, we'll, we'll visit, we'll learn, we'll re write a, read a book or whatever. Say, this is awesome. We need to be doing this. Right. But we don't know the story behind the story. And then what happens is if we start to go that route, we'll make this big shift. And I used, I've used the example for years that when I was a kid, we'd, we'd, we'd raise potatoes. And you put potatoes in the back of the pickup truck. If you went around the corner too fast, the potatoes all flew off the back of the truck. <laughs> and that's what happens. Right. And I've right. said many, many times, a pastor pastor will go read a book or go to a conference or go to a seminar, and we should. I believe in that. I just said yeah, that. Right, yeah. But what I'll do is come back, and it took God 20 years to get his attention on something. He expects everybody in the church to get it in 20 days. <laughs> really, that's what happens. <laughs> right. And then he wonders why yeah. people don't understand. It took God 20 years bumping in his head to get the, get the exit, you know, sure. get this thing down. Yeah. But they think everybody else should get it right away. And that's why wise leaders, will, yes, they will tweak, but they'll yeah. work with, they'll learn, and they'll work with them. We came back from Seoul, Korea. I mean, I was a crazy guy. We came back from Seoul, Korea because, I mean, they had 50,000 people in home groups there. Come the on. church wow. was 700,000 people. Right. I went to, <laughs> Cho invited me to a prayer meeting. Only people who came to the prayer meeting were small group leaders and, and the pastors and their assistant leaders. 80,000 people showed up in the Olympic Stadium for the prayer meeting, bro. Right. It's just crazy. We, yeah. So I couldn't wait to get behind the scenes, find one of the Korean pastors who spoke English. I had a whole list of questions and said, okay, why do you do this? How do you do this? How do you do this? And they, they basically said, look, we do prayer mountain. I mean, if, if things, if, if we have a small group that's not working well, we send them to prayer mountain. It's like going to purg purgatory, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, that's what we do. And I remember I thought, we need a prayer mountain. If we had a prayer mountain like they had, it would work, you know. So we came back, and I remember getting all of our leaders together. Uh -huh. I mean, I look back, I think, these poor people, I and mean, they, they were amazing, the people God gave us, and said, yeah. you know, in Korea, every six months, they keep starting new groups. So if they can do it, so can we. We serve the same God they serve. Right. So <laughs> I said, and we're going to do a separate prayer mountain. And so if you can't do that, well, then we'll have a prayer mountain. You go and figure out why, and God will show you. You know, We burn people out because we found out was there were, there's a value system in the Korean culture that was different here. There, 5 o'clock in the morning, they're up sweep, sweeping the streets, Merle. It was just a whole different, everything different, work ethic, everything different. And then a couple years later, they grew grew from 50,000 to 25,000 in their small groups. And do you know why? Because most of the groups were led by women, and women went back to work. The story behind the story. Wow. So, so wow. often there's a story behind the story, wow. and we need to continue to learn from everybody, you know, whoever yeah. God leads us to. Yeah. But be very careful how we implement it. I find often God will give a primary leader a vision, but the, the working out of that vision, you work with a team, you work with your people. And mm -hmm. there's just a timing issue involved there, and that's good leadership. Because yeah. otherwise you make shifts, and we, people are jumping off the back of the truck. Right. So, so is it is it is this what you're saying as well that like we tweak moving forward so we get the benefit of hearing what other people are doing yes we tweak it but we don't abandon the journey that god has taken exactly. us on that is exactly right you know I, and yeah I, I think sometimes when we jump sh from strategy to strategy to strategy i know this is true in other areas of life in it business is. And, it and is when you jump from strategy, you wind up actually coming out at a net loss you know that's right uh, because 
you're not sticking in something long enough to, to figure it out. And so, it's also because there's the story behind the story. We haven't, right, right. you know, everyone paints their, the picture beautiful. You know, this is sure. what God's doing. It's awesome. God's moving. And he is. Yeah. But there's things behind the scene. And you go to any church in America in the world, you're going to find these same kinds of things. I know because I get inside a lot of these systems. Right. And right. these are my friends. And yeah. I know there's some stories yeah. that you never read a book. And right. I'm not dissing anybody, but I'm simply saying it's life, it's reality. Sure. sure. So let's learn, grow, let's tweak, work with our team, and make the the changes we need to make because we want right. to grow and, and we want it to be better. And that's yeah. why we're getting input other places. Yeah. But then abandon everything and try this. And usually yeah. that's where the mistakes come. So so how then, like, because there is sometimes where you are hitting a dead end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you know, and I've, I've heard other people use this terminology, so it's not mine, but how do you know the difference between a dip yeah. and a cliff? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, well, how, do, how do you know when you need to just persevere? Yeah. And how do you know when, hey, it is time to change strategy? Because, yeah. I mean, just walk me through that. Walk us through that. That's uh, like, I'm happy to. You know, yeah. I'm happy to. I would say this. You know, there are so many voices in our lives. Everyone's got some different idea that's going to work and right, is the right. way it should work. We've got to know which voices has God called us to listen to. Now, obviously, his voice. But there needs to be a few people we trust. I have found in my life, if God's really in something, if he's really in it, obviously, it's scriptural. We all know that. But I'll know inside prophetically or through dreams or visions or word of the Lord, whatever. I'll know. But the timing is based on when those who I trust around me when they see the same thing, that's when I work at the timing. Hmm. And so, is it a cliff or is it a dip? Well, they help me. There's times or things could be a cliff. We need to make some major shifts. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I mean, when we had one church of a couple thousand people yeah. and made the shift in becoming a movement of churches in 1996, January 1, I was no longer a senior pastor. I was a member of one of eight churches. And that was a huge deal for us, a huge thing for us, but right. it was something God called us to do. And we took a couple of years to process through that and got input from all of the body of Christ. I mean, the key is there's safety in a multitude of counselors. There just is. Mm -hmm. And so if we can walk with others in the process, both inside and outside, uh, I find we can make wise decisions. And I would say this yet, never do something that somehow goes against what you know that you know that you know in your spirit. As a leader, when you really know something in your spirit, don't go against it. It might be a timing issue, but give God time to release that. Others will come into alignment and agreement with that. It will happen, but don't, don't compromise what you know God has said. Yeah. And if it's not for now, maybe it's for future, but don't compromise that because that's what God's calling you to walk in. So that's hard. It is very because hard. An example is, you know, I just got back from a trip where I heard of a pastor, and it wasn't where I was, but I heard of a pastor who, you know, came came back from I don't know from some time off and and fired his worship leader. Right. Just and and you know his his thing was I know God said so. Well, so but how? Yeah, okay. You know because wait, so but you said before you quoted the scripture we hear in part we prophesy in part. Right. Okay. So yes, we know God says something, but we need to recognize we still hear parts. Right. And that's why we right. must work with a team. Wise leaders always work with good teams. Yeah, you simply must. And I mean, there's there's things that I was I had in my heart for 25 years didn't happen. You know, things I'm seeing happen today that I dreamed about 25 years ago, and I thought it was going to happen 25 years ago, <laughs> but I didn't lose yeah. it in my heart. Yeah, yeah. See, so yeah. 25 years ago, you were just a little kid. <laughs> right, yeah. Yep. But I'm simply saying, you simply, okay, I know God said it. I don't have to force it. If God's in it, it's going to happen. Right. We all hear in part, prophesy in part. I really believe it is God, and I found out it was God, mm -hmm. but it took 25 years to fulfill that. Yeah. And I see that happening today. Yeah, man. That's awesome. So any, anything else you want to share with us about ch church playing movements and anything that would be to close this time that would be of importance regarding leadership? You know, we're saying a young leader, somebody in future leadership, yeah. any other principle you want to share with us yet before we close out? You know, one thing yeah, just in church playing movements has to be transferable and it has to be reproducible. Mm. Like those are kind of the two okay. things. So it has to be easily transferred. So... Our discipleship, our, our discipleship models. And that's one thing that uh, instead of being attractional for discipleship, we're like, come to our discipleship class and go through eight, 
eight classes or right, whatever. Right. I've seen the church planning movements. They they give the ownership of discipleship to the new believers, and and I mean we we know that new believers are oftentimes very excited, like they're passionate, they're encountering Jesus yeah, for the first yeah. time, and that passion fuels further outreach. And so that's like transferable yes. and it's reproducible. It's something that they can take and reproduce it to others. Yes. And so I, I think that's good. one of the big things. Keep is it simple, basically. Disi- yeah, keep it simple. Keep yeah. discipleship simple and outreach yeah. simple. Um, and, hey, you know, it's not that they're perfect. It's not that there's not hang-ups. There's not snags. You know, there's not people going off the deep end. And But... They probably would have done that anyway, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, but more people are being reached and, yeah. you know, it's following relational lines uh, yeah. um, like that. You know, I think the, I, I agree with that. And I think that's extremely helpful. I think the last thing I want to say is you asked me about what we learned about leadership in these areas. I think the thing I didn't mention that's important mm-hmm. is the need for all of us to have spiritual fathers and mothers in our lives. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the biggest mistake that I made, even as a senior pastor. I think we could have grown more, done a lot more. It could have been much smoother had we had a few people in our lives outside of us that I, yeah. I could have looked to. Because we thought God's blessing us, and we're growing right. 300 people every year for years, and this is a God thing. It was a God thing. Right. But then right. when we start having some, some conflict and areas of leadership, mm. I didn't know where to go. Uh, my friends didn't know where to, didn't know where to go. And that became very difficult. And I found, and of course today, we see the need for that in all of the world. We're trying to provide that for people to, to be right. spiritual followers to them. But I think any young leader, I'd really encourage you to if if you don't have someone in your life now, it, it can be two, three, four, five people. It can be for a short season or a long season. You talk about that Ter- one or more. It can be many. It can be it can be many. It really can. You know, like you mentioned John Mark before. John yeah. had Barnabas, but he also had Peter. Peter called him his right. son. Yeah, and yeah. so he had very. And I think this should, this can get messy. Look, I think I got to write a book on this sometime. There's so, so <laughs> many crazy things today in the name of spiritual fathering and mothering. It's controlling, it's right. manipulation, yeah. it's yeah. not that run from that. But it's simply, I've got people in my life older and wiser than I am that I can go to yeah. that speak in my life. I know that I got to try to change the vision. They're simply there because they love me and they love what I do. They love our family of churches and they've been in our family of churches. Right. But that's right. been really helpful for me. And I think that's important for every leader, regardless of whether you're in a church playing movement, rapidly reproducing, whether you're in that right. Right. and leading that. In fact, we find leaders of those kind of movements come to us. You right. know, I know right. a few right now in different nations and they're seeing these major church playing movements, but they're saying, I need connection. We need to be connected. We're trying to help them in that way. Right. So I think that's really also needed for someone who's going to do something new, plan a new church, start a new ministry, uh, ask God for that. Again, it can be short term, it can be long term, right. and it can be many. Right. And, and this is not, and this, it's really important we don't get into the controlling side. Uh, we're talking about finding those who find the vision in our hearts and help us fulfill that vision, right. that tell us what to do. Not to, well, right, and I think also, you know, the kind of the, the, the pivot point there shifts from finding the vision that's in our hearts to help us execute that to, right. to us being used to accomplish the vision that's in their hearts. And, that's right. You know, and I think that's the difference between controlling and, and real fathering. And, and listen, I mean, God sometimes brings people together and it's a mutual thing. You that's know, right. Like, and that's and right. there's a mutual blessing. In sure. That. And, that's great. And, you know, it, you, you, you fit each other like a hand mm-hmm. in a glove. Mm-hmm. And, and those are wonderful relationships. Yes, they are. But just, you know... And some of us are blessed to have that in our lives. Some of us aren't, mm-hmm. you know, out mm-hmm. there that would be listening to us. I think, you know, not everybody has those kind of right. relationships, but that's not the only kind of fathering that's right. that exists, right? There's, you can have, you know, other wise mentors. Uh, of course, in many areas of our lives. They like you. No, exactly. In fact, the people I look to in the Lord, I mean, are very much not like me <laughs> in so many ways. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of the same heart, but really, really a lot different than I am. But I find... And some have not even experienced what I've experienced in areas of leadership, but it doesn't matter. 
God divinely placed in my life for such time as this. And then it goes without yeah. saying, we're all called to become spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. I mean, that's what you're called to do. You're called to help others release others. And then and you yeah. talk about the whole church planning movement thing, and that's what they're doing. They're building spiritual families, Merle. That's what they're doing. Right. Right. And God's called us to do the same. So whether you were called to be involved in mega churches, it's going to happen in mega churches. You know, as long as there's some place for that, yeah, sure. it can happen in yeah. community churches of 75, 100, 500 people, whatever. And it can happen. And in these new micro churches you see springing up all over the world. Uh, but the key right. is to have these spiritual father and mothers, really, mothering relationships that are so important. So we're so glad you could join us today for the, this time of leadership and leadership training together, learning together from people who are doing it in different parts of the world. Merle, thank you so much. Great uh, insights you've pleasure, got. I mean, your years as a missionary, you know, yeah. and church planner there, and now yeah. and you're touching church people all over the world. Man. It's, man. it's awesome. Man. So it's, thank you. And we pray God's blessing on you. God's blessing on you that you be the yes. leader God's called Jesus you to be name. for the glory of God Thank in Jesus' God. name. Thank you for listening to Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. If you want more information about any of Larry's books, daily devotionals, small group resources, or any other teachings, go to LarryKreider.com. 